Welcome to question two of the Cambridge IGCSE reading paper. That's the one that's called First Language English 0522. Although that's the same um, questions as you'll get in the 0500 syllabus. This is question two from uh, last year's paper, May 2015. And the question will always be nearly identical. So uh, you need to look at two paragraphs. That will always be the case. And uh, you'll be able to find them because the quotations for the beginning of the paragraphs will be given to you. And then there's this really uh, powerful bit of advice. Uh, select four words, and probably the words will always be powerful as well, but from each paragraph. So in a class of 28 students, I always have two or three who just write about four words and forget that there's each paragraph. Now, these words might not be underlined for you in the question. I'm looking at the mark scheme here. So you need to underline the key words yourself. Uh, explain how each word or phrase is selected and used effectively. And you must talk about imagery, and we'll explore what imagery is in a minute. Uh, the word count is always the same, 200 to 300 words, although you're not really penalised for going over that. Um, and this question is only worth 10 marks. So if you know the exam, you'll realise that question 1 and question 3 are worth 20 marks. Uh, it's a two-hour paper, and many of you will run out of energy at the end. So I strongly advise you to do this question last. Don't do it in order. And the reason for that is, if you use up all your energy on this question, there are 20 marks going on question 3, and you're likely to chuck quite a few of them away. So uh, this is only worth 10 marks. Please do it last. OK, the examiners are trying to be really helpful. Let me show you how. Uh, they want you to be able to talk about images. And uh, you'll know that images are personification, simile, metaphor, um, alliteration, or anything to do with sound. But it doesn't matter if you don't name them. As long as you talk about it as imagery, you can still get the marks. And then there's another bit of help. Do not take marks off for inaccurate statements. Simply ignore them. So you can afford to make mistakes on this question, and you won't lose marks. The examiner will give you marks for any sensible comment. Uh, but this is going to be really important. You have to talk about correct meanings. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, you can even talk about non-vocabulary choices. For example, um, the punctuation used or the types of sentence. And you still get marks for that as long as you also have comments about vocabulary. Um, I wouldn't advise this. I'd, I'd stick to the vocabulary choices if you can. OK, now for the major pitfall in this question, and why even the best students rarely get full marks. This is a quotation question. And you've been doing that probably since year five. And you're an expert at it. The problem is, you're an expert at quoting um, literature in an essay. However, this exam asks you to do something vaguely ridiculous. It's very, very mechanical and stupid, but you have to do it to get the marks. So, now that I've whetted your appetite, let's see what that idiotic thing right, is. Right, to understand that, I've jumped to the examiner's advice on the 0500 syllabus. Um, it's exactly the same questions and the same paper as the 0522 syllabus. But I was curious to know why my own students didn't get full marks. And I couldn't find a clue in the mark scheme until I looked at the 0500 syllabus. So here it is. This is how the examiner is supposed to mark. Um, for imprecise or incomplete choices or explanations, they put this upside down V. Then, for meaning, i.e., that means that is, not for example, it means exactly... A dictionary definition, annotate X EXP. So the examiner wants you to write a dictionary definition of the words you're looking at. You would never do that in a literature essay. It would make you sound like an idiot. Um, and unfortunately, you have to write like an idiot for this bit to get the mark. 
and then you need an explanation in the margin about, sorry, they have to put the XB for an explanation in the margin about the effect. Um, then the effect is not EG, not for example, but IE. So the effect is the response it evokes on the reader. So the effect on the reader is. Those are the words you've got to use. And then finally, you've got to do something also very strange. You have to write an overview, um, and that's marked with an O. So I'm going to take you through those requirements so you can get 100%. OK, let's look at some of the language choices you could have made. Uh, so something here is described as an eyesore, and uh, in your literature essays, you'd go straight after quoting that, you'd go into saying what it suggests. It suggests it's painful to behold. But then you'd miss this whole bit of the mark scheme, where you have to translate eyesore. It means something very ugly, or something offensive to the eye. Then you'd write, this suggests that. Yeah? Or you would actually write, the effect of the reader on the reader is that we realise it's painful to behold. Here again, heavy shade. Uh, this means, literally, that it's very dark. The effect on the reader is to suggest that this is oppressive. You can see how it works. Noxious weeds. Noxious, dictionary definition, means poisonous or toxic. Um, this creates the effect on the reader of giving us a sense of the pollution and danger. You see how it works? And then if we jump down to the other paragraph you've got to write about, exactly the same thing is going on. Uh, the lips uh, or face tightened into a grimace. Uh, grimace is an ugly or distorted face. That's the dictionary definition. The effect on the reader is that it indicates uh, his disapproval caused by the tense muscles. Um, so you have to be really mechanical here by giving the dictionary definition, then suggest what the effect on the reader is. OK, so you've picked four quotations. You've written about them as imagery. Notice that nowhere in the examiner's mark scheme um, is there any detail about naming it as personification or simile or metaphor or alliteration. You don't have to name it. Although, if you know it, do, because it helps. Um, and then the same, four quotations from the next paragraph. Well, what's left to do? Nothing if we look at the question. Yeah, the question just said select four words from each paragraph. Uh, it must include imagery, explain how it's uh, used effectively, in other words, the effect on the reader. That's it, we've got full marks. We've got eight quotations, full marks, surely, but no. Because there's this highly annoying bit in the mark scheme. Now, this, by the way, is also in the um, 0522 mark scheme. This bit's exactly the same. The general effect is of an unsightly, hostile and wild area. Its danger is exaggerated as Rufus attempts to manipulate his audience. Now, you will notice that, in terms of exam technique, after you've written about these. So you've got two choices. You can leave a two-line gap. So once you've written about the quotations, you go back and put that general overview in. Or you can put this at the end after you've written about the quotations. When we move to the next paragraph, the general effect is of a furious man attempting to suppress the outward signs um, of his own anger, I suppose, and is potentially dangerous or comical. Again, you need to put in a comment about the overall effect. You won't know what that is until you've written about your images, and again, you've got the same choice. Leave two lines at the beginning or write it at the end. Two lines is clearly enough for an overview. So it's not hard for you to write it, but you need to do it to get 10 marks out of 10. Right, now I'm going to show you the same two candidates that were in my uh, question one video. So if I just pan up here, this is my um, brilliant candidate who I expect to score 100% on every question because he really is that good at English. He'd get an A star in uh, a-level uh, literature, no bother at all. But when we scan through his work, we can see that the examiner has annotated it for explanations, but these they think are incomplete, and uh, there are no pluses um, until we get to the final bit. In other words, 
he's writing too well for this examiner. He's writing it like a literature essay. And instead, he needs to be completely mechanical, giving the dictionary definition, saying what the effect on the reader is. And uh, he's just actually being too good for this exam. And obviously, he hasn't put in the overview, I say obviously, because that wasn't asked for in the question. And stupidly, when I taught this last year, I just taught them to answer the question. I um, hadn't looked at the other syllabus, 0500, to see quite how stupid the exam was and that you had to put the overview in. Uh, so there you go, his marks are 6 out of 10, uh, which is appalling. Um, he could get 10 out of 10 in his sleep, um, but it's because he's written too well, as though this was a literature exam. He hasn't followed the mark scheme. So that's my top tip. Follow exactly what the markers want, no matter how stupid, because you want to get 100%. Right, let's contrast that to the other candidate who got uh, the highest marks in the year for these three questions. And you can see he got 8 out of 10 and wrote much, much less. You can see by the pluses and the explanations that he's got more of them in. But he clearly also does not have the overviews. Um, it's harder for the examiners to see an overview anyway, because he hasn't separated it into two sections. He's written an introduction at the beginning where he could have put the overview, um, but he hasn't talked about the overall effect, uh, so he hasn't got the mark for it. You can see there's nothing um, credited for that opening bit. So this really is a mechanical point scoring exercise and you ought to be able to get full marks, 10 out of 10, simply by filling um, both pages. It's not about volume, and if you're used to writing proper PEE, P paragraphs, or PEA, where you put in a lot of analysis, uh, actually that doesn't get you any more marks. In fact, obviously you lose marks because you write too much, as you saw with the previous candidate. So, in some ways that's depressing because you're not actually being tested on proper English skills, but the good news is um, it's easy. It's mechanical and easy and you can actually aim for 100%. So I've tried to summarise that for you. Uh, question 2. Teachers and students often approach this question logically as a literature question, demanding P or PA paragraph responses. But this is not the exam skill. Instead use the mark scheme and uh, the student responses that I've shown you uh, to show why students should do the following. Use the word imagery and image uh, where you can't identify a simile or a metaphor or personification. Any reference to sound or alliteration counts as imagery. Um, directly after the quotation, you should write a dictionary definition of the words. In fact, you could even say a dictionary definition of this is. You could actually use these words. They're in the mark scheme. And then directly after the um, dictionary definition, instead of saying this supply, this implies, or this suggests, you're going to say the effect on the reader is, and then explain what it suggests. You know, use those words. Uh, this explanation is only one or two sentences. It doesn't have to be really long. It doesn't have to be developed with lots of um, real insight. Uh, after the four quotations from the paragraph, the student must write an overview, and I've said that afterwards because it's just easier, I think, than leaving a gap, using a word, these words, the general effect is. And if you do that, you can't fail to get 100%, unless, of course, you pick on something that isn't imagery. But remember, no marks are taken off, it's just um, not credited. So now you know how to get 100%. Uh, try some past papers, mark them, give them to your teacher, see if they agree. And uh, shortly, I'll do the video on question three.